This right here is the story of how you print free money. It's a story that involves an AWS account, a threat actor named Guiville, and unauthorized crypto mining. This story is real, and it happens more often than you might think. It's about a real attack that happened not long ago, and similar attacks have been going on for years, ever since crypto mining became a thing. But how does this actually work, and why does this still happen after all this time, and most importantly, how can we protect ourselves? In this video, I'm going to answer all these questions and I'll explain step by step how the threat actor carried out the attack, taking advantage of the victim's resources for illegal crypto mining, and I'll also share some tips on how we can defend ourselves from these types of attacks. Now, if you'd like to skip ahead to a specific section of this video, then check out the chapters below. Threat actors hijacking AWS accounts to crypto mine is an issue that's been going on for years. For perspective, this is an issue that I had to defend against regularly when I was securing Linux Academy's labs years back in 2016 and 2017. But in this video, we're going to look at a much more recent attack orchestrated and executed by a threat actor dubbed Guiville. This case study is straight from Permiso's labs team and blog, so all credit goes to them for the detailed report that inspired this video. Definitely check out their post if you'd like to learn more. So Guiville is a financially motivated threat group from Indonesia that specializes in performing unauthorized cryptocurrency mining activities. But how do they do it? Let's take a look at this step by step. A typical cloud cyber attack involves multiple different stages. Usually you have about five to six, and they are stage one, which is gaining initial access, stage two, which is reconnaissance, stage three, which is privilege escalation, stage four, which is persistence and maintaining presence, stage five is completing the mission, and I'm also going to add a stage six, which is evading detection. Because I only have so much time in this video, I'm going to go through all these stages pretty quickly. And I'm thinking about turning this into a full course. So let me know in the comments below if that would be of interest. And if I get enough comments, then I'll go ahead and do it. So the first stage to pull off this type of attack is to gain initial access to a system, service, or user that we shouldn't normally be able to access. There are multiple ways that this can happen in the cloud, but a common one and one that enabled this particular attack is the use of compromised credentials. What does that mean and how does one find compromised credentials? Well, I'm glad you asked. In this particular case study, Guiville used CVE 2021-22205, which according to NIST is a GitLab vulnerability that enabled remote code execution or RCE. The services web interface allowed people to upload malicious files, and then once uploaded, those files would open up a shell, giving the attacker access to the server that it was uploaded on. The problem is that even though GitLab patched the issue in 2021 very quickly after the vulnerability was first discovered and reported, some organizations running GitLab on premises, meaning that they're running their own installation of GitLab, still haven't patched the issue. This here is an older article, but even months after a fix was made available, we can see that at least 60,000 internet facing GitLab installations still hadn't patched. That meant threat actors could use these vulnerable servers as bots to be part of a massive botnet, or they could use their shell access to extract application and infrastructure credentials. So going back to our case study, that's exactly what Guiville did. The attacker exploited the vulnerability and then gained access to sensitive data by reviewing code repositories, which included the access key for an admin level identity in the victim's AWS environment. And if you're not familiar, access keys in AWS are what enable users to issue authenticated commands against the AWS API. So if you need to make calls to your AWS resources, you might create a user, generate secret access keys, which gives you an access key ID and a secret access key. And then you can use those access keys to authenticate and authorize your calls. Then whatever permissions your user has are the permissions that your access keys have. So if an attacker gets access to admin level access keys, they officially become admins of your AWS accounts. So to recap, Guiville found this vulnerable GitLab server, exploited the CVE, and then moved on to the next phase, which is reconnaissance. To validate that the access keys are real and still work, the threat actor then used a Windows GUI utility called the S3 Browser, which is a tool that you can use to manage your S3 or CloudFront resources in AWS via a GUI interface instead of logging into the AWS console or using the command line. GUIville entered the access key ID and the secret access key into the S3 Browser and then executed their first command, which was the list buckets command against the S3 service. 
We can see from this event log that the call was made by an IAM user. We can see the account ID and access key ID, which have been redacted or masked. And then we can see the event name as well as the source IP address and user agent, which confirms the use of the S3 browser utility. They run this command to verify that the access keys are still valid because it could be that the organization had already rotated or invalidated these credentials. In this case, they clearly hadn't, which told GUIville that they had something to work with. And it's at this point that an attacker will move on to stage four, which is persistence and maintaining presence. Once an attacker or pen tester knows that they have initial access, they will want to escalate privileges if it's even needed, or they will want to find a way to maintain presence, usually by means of creating some sort of backdoor. In the case of this attack, because they got their hands on an admin level account, they didn't actually need to escalate privileges, but instead they wanted to create a new identity in order to maintain access. Just because you found access to an admin account today doesn't mean that tomorrow that account will still be around or those credentials will still work. Instead, attackers want to create resources that only they control, and that way they know they can maintain access to the environment unless they get detected. So GUIville decided to use the access keys to issue the command create user, and they created an AWS IAM user named backup. They then issued the command create access key to generate their own access keys for that backup user. Then they issued the command put user policy to create a policy named backup user, which give full privileges to all resources and all actions for their backup user. Essentially, these are admin level privileges. And by the way, the video that I published right before this one actually demonstrates how to escalate privileges with put user policy to gain admin level privileges. So check out that video to see exactly how something like this can be done. At that point, GUIville can change their credentials and user to the backup user that they had just created, which will enable them to maintain presence. They can also enable AWS console access via create login profile for this user so that they can continue their attack from the management console instead of having to use the S3 browser or command line interface. From there, they can keep performing reconnaissance like to check to see what's going on with the EC2 service in this particular account. All right, so most of the hard work has now been done and we've entered stage five, which Permiso likes to call the complete mission stage, AKA set up crypto mining. This is where the magic happens and GUIville is able to print free money because about 31 minutes after gaining initial access, the attackers started creating EC2 instances to mine cryptocurrency from. They tried spinning up dozens of X-large EC2 instances across many regions, but they ran into resource limitations from AWS, which said that they currently didn't have enough sufficient capacity for P3.16X-large, but in total, they successfully launched 13 instances in five different regions, and all instances had the following attributes. As you can see, they disabled CloudWatch monitoring from reporting data about these machines. And as they created these resources, they generated key pairs via the EC2 create key pair command, which gives them the ability to connect to the EC2 instances directly via SSH. From there, they can run three simple commands to start mining via XM rig. They can run apt-get update, then app get install for a bunch of utilities needed for XM rig, and then actually launching XM rig. And by the way, if you want to see XM rig being used in action, check out my blog post called detecting and terminating malware in real time. Okay, so after accomplishing their mission, attackers will sometimes attempt to hide their tracks or evade detection. And I say sometimes because this depends on their skill level, their access, and some other factors, but if they know how and they have the ability, they will likely try to do this. With this case study, we already discovered that they disabled CloudWatch monitoring, but something else that GUIville has been known to do is to observe CloudTrail logs to see what changes the victim organization is making. That can indicate whether they know something is going on or not, and it can help the attacker find ways around attempts to block access. But ideally, the attacker will try to remain completely undetected for as long as possible, which means that they may modify the CloudTrail settings, they may modify some of the logs to hide resource creations, they may disable alerts or monitoring, they may even make changes to where notifications get sent to, etc. 
All right, we learned how this attack got carried out, but how can we defend against this in our own AWS environments? And how can we enable detection so that we're not finding out that this happened after we owe AWS tens of thousands of dollars for running 13 P3.16 extra large instances, which by the way, cost about $24.48 per hour per instance, AKA about $318 per hour, also known as about $7,600 per day. I'm sorry, I, I know it's not funny, but I've been there, I know your pain. And also as a side note, I've known AWS to work with organizations in order to give them credits for these costs. I'm not saying this is a guarantee and I'm sure sometimes they don't do that, especially if it looks like you made zero efforts to protect your account. But if you ever find yourself in this situation, just talk to them, see what they can do to help. Okay, so to defend against this, obviously you wanna try and avoid compromised credentials as much as possible. That means patch your GitLab servers if you haven't in the past two years. And then if you're using access keys, make sure that you're properly storing and managing them and then ensure that they get rotated on a schedule. Ideally though, you wanna avoid using access keys and instead you wanna make use of roles. Next, and this one is non-negotiable, stop using admin privileges for users or roles that are running your applications. A lot of this is explained in my introduction to AWS security course, but there is not a single application you are running that requires admin privileges. Applications will require access to other services, sure, but that's the only permissions that you should be granting them. Follow the principle of least privilege. After that, you can look at Permissive's blog post for atomic indicators, Permiso CDR rules, and basic Sigma rules. They also have a list of observed events that could potentially indicate that something odd is going on in your account. Beyond covering the basics of AWS security, this information can help you set detection processes in place to detect this sort of attack, not just from GUIville, but other similar threat actors. All right, so what do we think? Should I create a course that walks through this attack hands-on instead of just discussing concepts? Let me know in the comments below if you think I should, or just let me know, what did you think of this video in general? Hey, I appreciate you taking the time to watch today and please like the video and subscribe if you enjoyed it and watched this far so that others can also find this video and learn from it as well. And don't forget to share with your colleagues because they probably need to see this too. Thanks and I'll see you next time.